Welcome back to HTM Insider. We're so excited about our guest today. Thanks for tuning in. My name is Sherelle. I'm with Multi Medical Systems and the host of the podcast. We're just so excited to talk to Arlene. Arlene is such a powerhouse in the industry. I've been so lucky to know her and follow her since 2016 when she was in Fresno, California, and now she's in New York managing, I think, at least nine facilities. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our guest, Arlene. Oh, thank you, Cheryl. Um, my name is Arlene Takarl. I'm the Vision 2 Healthcare Technology Manager in New York and New Jersey healthcare system. So I oversee uh, nine healthcare systems in the VA, and I started off in my career in the technical career field program um, in Milwaukee. And after I graduated from that program, I um, moved to Fresno, where I was the chief um, HTM at Fresno. Then I moved on to Vision 21, um, where I'm sorry, Vision 20, where I was the staff biomedical engineer at the Vision. Um, and now I've been in my current role for over four years. Amazing. Let me ask you real quick, how did you get into the HTM industry? What was your pathway? So I heard about the per clinical engineering as a uh, discipline when I was in college and very close to graduating, actually, my last semester. And um, there was an email from the Career Center about this technical career field program in the VA. So I applied. Um, did an interview and was really excited by the opportunity because it was a good intersection of applying a lot of different medical technologies um, and uh, having kind of pursued uh, my master's and done uh, a lot of research work in tissue engineering. I was more interested in seeing a faster life cycle of projects, and I knew that I could see that through with working with clinicians in the clinical setting. I, I just have really enjoyed watching your career and following you. Being a female in the industry as well, I think you're a great role model for younger women who want to get into the HTM field. So thank you for all you do and being a powerhouse. Oh, thank you so much, and thank you for having me on this podcast. Very excited to be here. No, oh, it's our, our our pleasure, our honor to have you on. So today, folks, we're going to be talking about that data, data in the HTM industry. You know, we all have it. We have CMS programs. Um, we're always organizing the data, tracking the data. But what can we do with the data? that can make things better overall. And I find this completely fascinating because I think we have the evidence and I think the data provides the evidence where we can make change. And that's what we're going to talk about today. <clears throat> One of the things we're going to try to do is this hits a broad spectrum of listeners is really to go over the acronyms too. So Arlene, if you can think about the new biomed, let's just break down the acronyms for everybody when we're talking about them. But Starting off, I know we all talk about KPIs, right? What is the data that you're using? And let's just jump into that data and how KPIs, key performance indicators, are beneficial in the HTM industry. Yeah, so um, KPI, or as you know, you define the acronym, key performance indicator, are really those key metrics that you want to trend and it should be something that's important that's going to help you steer your department um, if things are not, you know, if um, you as a department is not meeting those key performance indicators. So, um, of course, the number one um, KPI that departments are tracking are preventative maintenance completion rate. So, our policies. Um, should define how we're calculating, um, you, you know, the PM completion rate. Um, sometimes uh, it's based on when the uh, PM work order is generated. Sometimes it's based on the due date of the PM work order. So, you know, there are nuances to how we're measuring um, that indicator, but we definitely should be um, consistent with how we're measuring so that we can compare month to month and trend over time. Um, 
Joint Commission does require 100% preventative maintenance uh, completion rate. Um, that doesn't mean that you have to do everything. Every single PM work order um, has to be completed. Um, it means that you have to document, you know, exactly if the PM was could not locate or in use and um, close out and follow your healthcare policy on however you handle those deferred preventative maintenance. Um, Another really key performance indicator that most departments are following would be your corrective maintenance turnaround time. Um, so this is where you have those repair work orders coming in from your customers. You know, typically you're measuring it from when the customer puts in the work order to when you resolve that work. So, um, you know, uh, uh, the VA has a target that they've set for what this uh, corrective maintenance turnaround time should be completed within. Um, we we target seven days turnaround time. Um, of course, we've had supply chain issues in the past several years, and um, it's a good idea to be able to break down if you're not meeting the metric, um, what might be contributing to that. So um, a good way to to analyze that might be um, seeing the top uh, assets or asset types that are contributing mm -hmm. to the longest turnaround time. And, you know, looking at that uh, documentation, trying to figure out, you know, is anything that you can action to, ex you know, uh, cut down that turnaround time. So, um, perhaps you're awaiting parts. Um, perhaps there are things that are outside of your control, like you need to work with contracting. Um, you know, some of those things, just being able to explain to leadership, okay, um, I'm actually meeting nine days turnaround time, but, um, you know, a significant uh, portion of the work orders are um, that are contributing to that longer turnaround time or, or, or X. And you know, maybe you have um, a secondary uh, monitor, such as uh, your work orders that are completed in, in three days. So this is um, a percentage that you can keep track of to see, all right, well, if your department is hitting 70% of its corrective maintenance within three days, then it means it's fairly efficient that only a small subset of work orders are actually um, you know, taking longer and um, you can also keep track of number of work orders open over 30 days. So that's going to give you a good indication of if that's starting to go above perhaps 50 work orders, then um, maybe you need to start looking at additional staffing and um, overtime or bringing in third party support to make sure that um, that's not going to continue to creep up and you're, you're getting a handle on that. Yeah, and I, I would imagine that at your level, this is something that you're able to spend some time and to focus on and affect change, right? Absolutely. So, um, you know, any department that um, we see that has for at least one quarter um, not met PM completion rate, we're going to take a look at what are their open PM work orders that are overdue. So if they have, yeah, go ahead. Uh, so let's talk to the general biomed. You're a BMET 1, you're a BMET 2, you're handling PMs and repairs, you're on the floor. How important is it to have those notes in your work orders? So a director, a manager, a regional person can really identify what the issues are. I know we open and close work orders every day. Um, and you're talking about the work orders that are open longer. How important is it? For the be met to affect change from your perspective. Yeah, we really rely on our staff at the front line to document on a daily basis. Um, we actually have states of our work orders in our CMMS that increase this visibility. So um, for one example is that a work order can be put on hold and then the substate can be selected is the work order awaiting parts or awaiting um, um, 
you know, organizational need has changed. So maybe you can't complete the incoming inspection because there's some construction aspects that need to be taken care of first from outside of our department. So um, it's really nice to have that visibility for the manager or even the regional director that, uh, oh, we can actually ignore the things that are on hold. Um, similarly, um, a PM work order has been completed, then the state can be moved to pending documentation if it was especially vendor performed because we're we know we're still waiting on the service report from that vendor and um, you know it's in the process of getting uploaded. And again, we can rest assured that the work has been completed and it's timely, but we just have some finishing up documentation to be done there. So, uh, definitely super critical that the front line is documenting daily. It also helps the customer stay up to date on things because um, they can also often in CMMSs check in from their side on um, whether the work has been done. Now I'm thinking about how does this play with cybersecurity? So doing patches and updates, I can imagine that can slow down maybe your process or your documentation and make your KPIs not look as great or have to dive in. Tell us about how that correlates. So we have started to um, measure a lot more with cybersecurity. Um, one example is percent of devices that are unsupported um, out, out of all of our networked uh, medical devices. So the reason this is important to track is because um, unsupported devices, if they have a failure, oftentimes the manufacturer will say you need an upgrade on the spot. And that's going to then, you know, really be a rush job that um, typically setting everything up on the um, medical device protection program does take time. You have to, um, you know, make sure that the ACL has correct, that's access control list or firewall, maybe on in the private sector, has to have the correct ports um, open through the firewall. And, you know, just um, setting up the device in a secure fashion um, with um, antivirus and everything, all of that takes time. So, um, you know, you'd, you're going to be affecting and patient care while you're getting the system set up in an emergency situation. Um, so in order to be proactive, we need to be starting to plan upgrades or replacements for that unsupported OS. So we're really looking at what, you know, what's the percent of devices in our fleet that are unsupported, whether or not we have been um, planning for replacement or upgrade. Um, we also look at vulnerability patching, so percent of Windows vulnerabilities that are patched within 30 days. So the VA has this um, really wonderful tool um, that's Windows based called SMAC. And it's basically a registry edit that allows us to collect um, information about the operating system MAC address um, what patches are on that device automatically into our network medical database. And so if we have set up automatic patching or are doing manual patching, um, we will be able to know whether or not um, those patches have been done and kind of keep track of um, if they're within that 30 days. So um, we don't really have a great um, correlation yet between um, the patching activity and how many corrective maintenance work orders that's preventing, um, but it is widely accepted in the field that, you know, keeping up with the patching does help pre uh, prevent issues and downtime. Um, and so uh, only one time did we have a patch where we ended up spending um, two hours um, having to kind of reinstall um, that was vendor approved patch and um, you know there may be more that I'm not aware of but uh, you know whenever that does happen we document the time that we spent on the vulnerability patching activity we do have uh, now in our Nivolo CMS a vulnerability work order type where we can document those types of things. Yeah that's great how is IT to work with on this are they are they on the same page with clinical engineering? Um, so 
within my region, um, you know, uh, and in the VA in general, uh, HTM is much more involved in the cybersecurity than maybe the case in the private sector. Um, so we are, you know, fully responsible for, for the vulnerability patching. Um, where we correspond with IT would be um, having them apply the ACLs. So we put in the request for ACL modification or um, the request for new VLAN and they actually set it up um, on their side. And, um, you know, I think that the collaboration is really good in Vizin2. Um, you know, I've always been able to um, talk to an area manager if an issue comes up and see if we can either elevate it to the national level or get it resolved at our level. That's amazing. And that's great to hear that you guys are all working together. It, bottom line, it's patient care. Um, so what? Let's let's talk to, like you say, the private sector. Let's talk to those HTM directors who may just be managing one hospital, right? They're in-house or maybe there's three in their network. How can they adopt some of what you're doing at their level? Absolutely, so I think the key is to first start with deciding what area to focus on for improvement. Um, you have to take a look at the data quality that you have. So is your inventory accurate? Um, you know, are you naming things and are you even able to pull out the PM completion rate for high risk versus non high risk? So if you don't have a defibrillator that's called a defibrillator in your inventory, you know, you're not going to be able to separate that into your high risk PM completion rate. So first measuring the baseline of your data quality and seeing if you're able to get that baseline, um, you know, based on where your inventory is at um, is the first step. Um, then it's really important to get the team involved. So, you know, um, something I've done in the past at uh, my sites is something called the wins and woes exercise. Um, so Sigma Healthcare actually um, pitched this at our national level and I really liked this, so I adopted it. And um, the concept is to have you know your team identify what are the things that they're proud of and what are the things that they find are challenges and need improvement. So by going through this activity with the whole team, you're definitely going to get a really good idea of what the current state is. Um, that will help you you know identify what are the areas that need focus and improving. And then once you you know come up with the goal with the team, um, you can start to come up with your timeline for improving it. And um, again, identifying the metrics that can help you improve the area that you want to focus on. Um, so, you know, we talked about a couple of key per performance indicators, some cybersecurity metrics. Um, maybe what you decide you want to focus on is in the fiscal arena. So, you know, your hospital budget is constrained and your leadership is telling you that you need to um, figure out some cost savings. If that's the case, um, a really good metric is your annual cost of service ratio. So this is the cost that you're spending on your equipment. So whether it's your contracts and times and materials divided by the medical equipment asset value um, of that equipment. So um, we we like to um, try to aim for 9%, um, but it's really hard to do. Um, some of my facilities are in the 11 to 12%. Um, and you know, we, we're constantly looking at um, is there an area where we can send somebody to training and, you know, what's the return on investment for um, can we reduce a contract down to first look or remove a contract? So we've done that with things like Metavators. Um, certainly we've sometimes sent people to train just to have faster turnaround time um, and still keep the parts contract. Um, because the parts can be co uh, costly and you, you do have to factor that. Um, and, you know, uh, tracking uh, uh, overtime usage is another um, good fiscal metric to make sure that you um, do have visibility on that as well. I'm going to pick your brain and this is, you know, 
definitely your opinion, how you see things, but there's a lot of third party companies out there that manage a lot of hospitals. Um, how as a director would you make sure that they're performing and they're providing this data with to your system? Does that make sense to you what I'm asking? Yeah, so how do you how do you, how do you manage that? How do you who polices that if you have a third party in there, in there? Yeah, so um all of the departments are able to um get, you know, multiple quotes and make that determination at the frontline level of whether or not um you know to go to a certain vendor and um there may, might be um you know advantages and disadvantages that need to be considered um so for example um it's a good idea to always look at the iso compliance of third parties to make sure that um the work will be done um according to a quality standard um you know, we um, do ask vendors for training um, certificates as well, um, especially, um, you know, sometimes if we're going to be contracting with a vendor, we ask them for their resumes um, to ensure that, you know, they have the uh, level of uh, work that we're looking for, maybe technician one, or if it's an imaging, a higher technician level. Um, and uh, ultimately, uh, there, we don't have an integration with third parties for documentation. Uh, there's some government requirements with authority to operate, so um, we haven't been able to set that up as of yet. Um, definitely want to move in that direction in the future. Um, so what we're looking at uh, is just collecting the service reports and then getting that uploaded. So what if you actually, as a health system, you're a big IDN um, and you bring in a full service asset management company to be your HTM, right? To manage your clinical engineering. Now you're the director of the in-house director, let's say it's 15 hospitals. How would you hold that third party accountable who's actually providing your HTM service? I would think that you would still want that data to know how you can improve and if they're living up to what they promised. Yeah, and I think quality assurance programs are a great way to, um, you know, triple check that the quality of work is correct. So what I mean by that is um, you set a certain percentage of work orders that you're going to look into. So maybe that's 2%, um, whatever threshold you set. And you would then, you know, go through the service report and cross-reference that against the service log on the equipment and actually ensure that the documentation is exactly as the manufacturer specifies. Um, we, you know, might, uh, for example, uh, require the centrifuge speeds to be documented for centrifuge um, PM or um, an EKG might want to document information from a manual um, battery discharge test. So whatever um, you know, work order comes up that you review, you would first look up the service manual, then you would look up the you know, service report that's attached to that work order and ensure that you, you don't have any findings. Yeah, that, that, that's a great idea. And I gotta go back to this wins or woes. It's just circling in my head. I'm thinking, gosh, I could implement that in, in my in my area of expertise. You know, what a great way to get feedback from your team who's actually doing the work instead of always telling them this is how we're going to do it right from your perspective. Oh, yeah, we got so many good ideas. Um, you know, it, it kept us busy, too, because then we had to make sure that we um, worked on those improvements that people suggested. So um, one example was an um, environmental care uh, TMS class for our clinicians. So um, we do have one specific to our CMMS for clinicians on how to enter work orders, but we didn't have something comprehensive about our entire program. Um, so that was a great suggestion that came out of that exercise. Um, but, you know, we, we captured a lot from that. Do you continue to do it? Is it something you do semi-annually or how do you implement it? 
Um, so last year was the first time I did it, and it's um, something I'm looking to do on an annual basis. Um, we do also conduct program assessments um, on an annual basis, so I think, you know, we have uh, a good idea from that as well of things that we may not be meeting. And what a safe place to have your staff come and be able to, like, let you know their perspective. Um, I think that's... Ah. Gosh, you're talking about building a company culture. That is like saying we want your opinion and, and really valuing what they're doing with their work is and not just having expectations. I really love that. I think that's going to be a, a big takeaway for me from this episode. So what is it? What's anything else you can think of with the data? What would you like to do in the future? Do you have any? Gosh, I hope to make this change or affect this in the HTM industry, what's the future hold for Arlene and collecting data? You know, that's a great question because um, it really is something that we continue to reflect on. Um, we have an environment of care quarterly report and um, we really do um, add new metrics on that or remove ones that we no longer need to monitor on an annual basis. So we we do look at this on a recurring basis. Um, I can tell you that uh, we want to keep a closer um, eye around our contracts for the coming year. So um, the new CMMS allows us to um, keep our contracts with and terms and conditions for those contracts um, within the system. So that's a, hu a huge improvement for us. And um, we've added a couple of um, uh, ideas. I, I don't want to call them metrics because they're really more um, self-reported things rather than like automatic metrics that um, will allow the manager to keep a closer eye on um, you know things that they could update their leadership on and as well um, you know make sure that the whole team um, is communicating regarding you know especially when you have on-call programs um, you know you can't just rely on um, everyone knowing everything and you need to have good documentations and checklists that people can refer to so this is where having an up-to-date CMMS on your contracts is super vital. Yeah, I think it is, and especially when it comes to the forensics of clinical engineering, when we do have something that happens, is just having that documentation, right? That's key. Well, I've really enjoyed having you on today, and now we always close with our wow word, our wow words of wisdom. So Arlene, what do you got for us? All right, well, um... I think I just want to go back to, um, you know, if you're a new manager somewhere, um, you need to kind of get the 30,000 view and figure out what are the most important things that you need to focus on. Um, so, you know, like you said, it, it's really good idea to ask the team. So use that wins and woes exercise and ask the team what their thoughts are because um, that's a really good place, like affecting change where it will affect the front line first. Yeah, I like that. That wins and woes. I mean, celebrate the wins and take the woes as how can we improve, right? What can we do better? Not personally, but just just always looking and focused on patient care and patient safety. That's what we're here for, right? Exactly. Listeners and watchers, if you guys want to tune in, you guys can find us anywhere you listen to your podcast, whether it be Spotify, iTunes, YouTube. And if you go and check out this episode again on Tech Nation, you'll actually receive one CE credit, which is an amazing partnership that we have providing you with that credit to continue your certified biomed education. So thanks again, Arlene, for having you on today. And thanks for tuning in. And we'll see you on the next HTM Insider.